Hello everyone, welcome back for part three of lecture 13, where in this section we're going to do some practice energy balance problems, and we're also going to discuss some key phrases to help us simplify those energy balances. Now, as I mentioned in part two, we have a little bit of an issue when we deal with internal energy and enthalpy. We talked about that, the fact that you need to talk about differences in internal energy or enthalpy in order to figure out the energy contribution from internal energy or enthalpy changes. And for us, what we'll do is one of the ways we can attack this issue is we can use a table to calculate our change in internal energy or our change in enthalpy. And with these tables, there's always going to be a reference state where it specifies a temperature, a pressure, and a, a phase and composition that is the, that it will be selected to be zero. And for steam tables, which we're going to get to in lecture 14, the reference state is temp uh, a temperature of 0 0.01 degrees Celsius, a pressure of 0 0.00611 bar. And if you're wondering why that, why those values, it's because that's the triple point for water, which makes it actually a very reasonable location or reference state. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a, a sample table that we, we're gonna look through and do a practice internal energy and enthalpy problem. So here's a data table for saturated methylene chloride. And I just, I'm just showing you that you have different states, you have different temperatures, pressures, uh, specific volumes, as well as specific enthalpies. And the first question I have for, for our system is, what is the reference state? And as I mentioned before, that reference state is going to be the one where our enthalpy is going to be defined as zero. So if we look again at this, if we look at, at our table again and look to identify where we have zero for enthalpy, we're going to notice that it's actually located at a, for the state the, where we have a liquid. It's at negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit, pressure of 6.878 PSI, and a specific volume of 0 0.01553. So for us, we're going to list that as our reference state. And then the next question we have is calculate our specific enthalpy and specific internal energy for methylene, for methylene chloride when we're going from 50 degrees Fahrenheit to zero degrees Fahrenheit. So if we approach this problem and start with our specific enthalpy, we're, we're going to look at the change. Uh, look at, uh, we're going to look at the change in specific enthalpy and look at final enthalpy minus initial enthalpy. And so if we take those values, some of those values from the table, we'll have 196.23 BTUs per pound mass minus 202.28 BTUs per pound mass, giving us negative 6.05 BTUs per pound mass. Now, if you're wondering what is a BTU, it is a form of energy. It's a British thermal unit, as I'm sure you're familiar or as I'm sure you know, it's part of, it's part of the English system, which we all love those units. And I just wanted to remind you what a BTU stand, stood for. And yes, we will probably have to do some converting with this problem, but we'll get there in a little bit. Okay, so we've now solved for our specific enthalpy. The next thing we gotta look for is our change in specific internal energy. So in this case, our, our change in specific internal energy will say is the change in specific enthalpy minus the change in our flow work. So delta P times V hat right where uh, that will all that will turn into uh, minus p final v final minus p initial v initial so if we substitute in our, our values for the system we know that we have negative 6.05 btus per pound mass for the specific enthalpy for p final v final if you read from the table you should get 18.9 multiplied by 4.969 and then subtract out 51.99 times 1.92. And if we combine all those values together, what we'll get is negative 6.05 BTUs per pound mass minus negative 5.9067 times pound force per inch squared times foot cube per pound mass. And as you might notice, those units are not the same as BTUs per pound mass. And that's where our unit conversions are going to come in, in handy. So for here, we're going to multiply by, we're gonna convert from our inches to feet, and we're gonna convert from BTUs to foot times pound force. 
or rather, we're going to convert from foot times pound force to BTUs. And after doing all these conversions, we will get that we have negative 1.09 BTUs per pound mass. So if we combine all this together, we are going to get a change in specific uh, internal energy of negative 4.96 BTUs per pound mass. All right. And now for an open system, I wanted to also just remind you of a couple of different items that you should just be mindful of. So for example, for our kinetic energy, we know that it's m dot times v out, v squared out minus v, uh, v, in, uh, v squared in divided by two. And if you have a, a stream that's flowing through and it goes through a, let's say a nozzle, where you have material coming in, you have material coming out, what you should pay attention to is if the diameter decreases, that velocity is going to increase, causing you to have a change in your kinetic internal energy. And you know, uh, similarly with our potential energy, if we have material that's starting at a low point and then increases by 50 meters in height, we're going to have an increase in our potential energy. Right, and these are just a couple of things I want to remind you about just to be mindful of because yes, we do, we, for most of the time, we kind of ignore kinetic and potential energy, but some of the times it may come to come into play. And it may not be for this class, it might be for thermodynamics one or thermodynamics two. So now just moving on, going into our next practice problem, we have an exothermic chemical reaction taking place in a continuous adiabatic reactor that contains no moving parts. The velocity and height changes are negligible, and so the question is, what is the delta H? All right, so let's try and break this problem down piece by piece and just find all the useful pieces of information in this problem. So if I just eliminate the, all the text and just start from the beginning and just try to pick out some key words. So if we look through this first part, we see that we have an exothermic chemical reaction, doesn't really help us. It's continuous, all right, that indicates it's an open system. And we have an adiabatic reactor. Okay, so since we see that the word adiabatic is present, that tells us that our Q dot is going to be zero because we have no heat tra traveling in or out. All right, great. So now if we continue moving forward in the word problem, we see that we have no moving parts. And because we have no moving parts, you guess it, we have no shaft work. So we've eliminated another part. And now, looking as we continue forward, we see the velocity and height changes are negligible. So we can eliminate both the kinetic and potential energy terms. And therefore, we're actually going to get a delta H equal to zero. All right. Well, that was a pretty simple problem. Cool. Okay, and so now we're gonna jump over to another energy balance problem. So we've got a stream of air being heated from 25 to 150 degrees Celsius. The change in specific enthalpy associated with this transition is 3,640 joules per mole. The flow rate of air at the heater outlet is 1.25 meters cubed per minute, and the air pressure at this point is 122 kPa absolute. All right, and so assuming ideal gas behavior as well as negligible changes in kinetic and potential energy, how much heat must be added to the airstream? All right, so we've got our we've got our energy balance to start off, and now if we look through this problem and just try to identify what terms we can eliminate immediately, we can see that we have negligible, negligible changes in kinetic and potential energy, so I can eliminate those two immediately. Great. We also can eliminate shaft work because in this in the system we don't see any moving parts being spoken about and because we don't hear about any moving parts it doesn't sound like there's anything moving we can also assume that there's zero shaft work and now what i want to do is just pick out the the important pieces and pieces of information for us so we know that we have a specific enthalpy of 3640 joules per mole we know that our temperature our initial temperature is 25 degrees celsius our Final temperature is 150 degrees Celsius. And we also know that we have a volumetric flow rate of 1.25 meters cubed per minute. And we know that we have a pressure of 122 kPa. Now, for the volumetric flow rate and the pressure, something to pay attention to is that <clears throat> those two pieces, the flow rate of the air at the heater outlet is 1.25 meters cubed per minute. And the air pressure at this point is 122 kPa, absolute. So 
Just be mindful that the volumetric flow rate and the pressure are for the outlet region, not for the inlet. All right? And I'm mentioning that because that may come into play on the next slide. And so now, moving forward, the question is, well, how do I, how do I use all that information to figure out the, the amount of heat being added to our airstream? So how to, like the Q term. Well, there's, there's a phrase in here that is going to help us with that. And that's, set, that's the phrase, assuming ideal gas behavior. And why, why would that be useful for us? Well, with our I, because we can assume, well, actually, looking at the enthalpy term, it's in terms of joules per mole. And we know that's a specific enthalpy. So in order to go from specific enthalpy to an actual change in enthalpy, we need to multiply by a flow rate, either a mass or a molar flow rate. And since this specific enthalpy is in terms of moles, we're going to need to multiply by a molar flow rate to convert. And because of that, because we need a molar flow rate, what we're going to do then is we're going to use the ideal gas law to back out the molar flow rate. And that's why that assuming ideal gas behavior is so important for us. So moving forward, I just wrote on the left-hand side all those pieces of information that could be useful to us. And now we're gonna work with our ideal gas law. So we have PV dot equals N dot RT. We can rearrange and solve for our N dot, our molar flow rate. And in this case, we know that we have to work with our outlet, our outlet conditions because, as I mentioned before, the volumetric flow rate and the pressure are at the, are at the outlet. So we got temperature is equal to 150 degrees Celsius, but because we're working with the ideal gas law, we should be converting to Kelvin, which is so it's 423 Kelvin. And so now we can substitute in all our known values into the ideal gas law equation. And from there, we can solve for our n dot and get that n dot is 43.36 moles per minute. All right. And so now, moving on, we I, on the left side, I'm now updating what we have as useful terms. And as a reminder, we, we have established that q dot is going to equal delta h dot. And because we have a specific molar enthalpy, or specific, we have a specific enthalpy, yeah it's going to equal n dot times delta H hat, where I can multiply our, mol our molar flow rate by our specific enthalpy to get our Q dot. And so I'm going to do that. I'll substitute our values in. We'll get 157,830 joules per minute. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna further convert that into kilowatts because that's the proper power term that we should be using, or at least watts. Watts or kilowatts, both are fine. And we'll get that our Q dot is equal to 2.63 kilowatts. And that's, uh, and that's how we, we're going to solve that problem. And that's actually going to wrap up lecture, lecture 13. And for this lecture, as a reminder, we got to go through some different practice problems with our energy balances. And we're beginning to identify key phrases that are going to be very important with helping us simplify and solve our energy balances. So thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you soon.